Leith, it is an absolute honor to have you with me on the Nothing Is Wasted podcast. Thanks for joining Thanks me. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> well, I, I, we talked a little bit off air, but I just want our listeners to understand what a special moment this was for me. I don't remember if it was 2014 or 2015. I can't recall at the time, but I know it was not too, uh, not too long before my, my wife was killed that I heard you speak at a workshop for Wesleyan pastors at Indiana Wesleyan University. And you were talking about the concept of 24 six, which was your work on the Sabbath. And it was pivotal for me. Um, and, uh, you know, many of our listeners are going to know about and be familiar with our pain to purpose course and the pathway that we take people on, but it was very instrumental in helping me to heal from the crisis and tragedy that my life would see in a couple of years uh, following that and, and then how to kind of create rhythms for ongoing wholeness. And so, man, I just want to thank you. This is a special honor for me to have you as a guest on this podcast. Well, it's, it's always delightful to, to hear that your, your work has done something. So I, I appreciate the encouragement. Well, I would highly recommend everybody to read 24 six and maybe we'll talk about a little bit of those concepts here in this, but you have uh, come out with another work, and uh, this one is, I mean, just as significant, just as pivotal, especially in this season that we've been going through. And you're really helping uh, the church and really just church culture to kind of get underneath and have an understanding of, of mental health and what we should do about it. Um, will you tell me just a little bit, first of all, before we dive into all of this, tell me what you do. Tell me a little bit about Dr. Matthew Sleeth, and, uh, and, and so we can get some context for where we're going to go here. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a loaded question, wasn't it? What do you do? Tell you me know, about when yourself. I, <laughs> I became a Christian late in life, and I was uh, 47, 48 years old when I picked up a Bible for the first time and read it. And when I read it, I was chief of staff at the hospital, head of the emergency department, um, you know, a, a we be bad kind of ER doctor <laughs> and everything. Mm -hmm. And the Lord called me out of that into what I'm doing now. And my daughter uh, used to say that the hardest thing to answer was, what does your dad do? Uh, you know, <laughs> and she said <laughs> before it was so simple. And afterwards, uh... it's like, well, he's trying to serve God. And he's, he's you know, so yep. um, what I do is... Uh, to I think a lot of what I do boils down to trying to bring up things to the church, which either the mm. church has forgotten or they haven't seen in scripture and in other words, calling them yeah. back to um the sabbath i I wrote a book on trees in the Bible because <clears throat> trees are the most mentioned living thing in scripture other than God and people. Um, et cetera. Right. And, and so, um, and the, the latest book is called hope always. And the subtitle is how to be a force for life in a culture of suicide. And again, the, the average person, uh, who goes to church <clears throat> has never heard a sermon on, on suicide. Mm. Um, mm. and yet the Judeo Christian, uh, theology uh, Christian theology is the only theology that explains where suicide comes from and yeah. um, and, and really has a lot of the tools um, to help people through very hard times. And so that that's a long question. I don't have a short elevator uh, yeah. answer uh, yeah. for it. But in, in, in other words, yeah. I think the Lord gives me very difficult things to do. Yeah. And yet, um, because of that, I get to see the Holy Spirit at work and... And, yeah. and I get to see yeah. mountains moved <laughs> occasionally. Right, right. Yeah. Well, you know, what I found was so fascinating when I first heard you about the work that you do is that, you know, you have these years of experience um, as an ER doctor and, and, and seeing patients as they're coming in in, in crisis. Mm -hmm. and, and you were kind of noticing like, wait, like this, even though we're, even though we see this as, as a commonality, it seems like we see high stress levels, we see, you know, uh, chronic disease. We see heart issues. We see all these kind of things all the time in especially Western American culture. Um, it's, it shouldn't be this way. Yeah. yeah. And we're, there's a certain, there's a certain way about our lifestyle that it seems to be contributing to all of this stuff. And, and, and then 
And then when you started bringing out the truths of scripture and how scripture speaks to those things, it was just, it was such a paradigm shift for me, you know? Um, so t tell me a little bit about your, your experience with that and what was like some of these discontents that caused you to go out of the work that you were doing and stepping into the work that you do now. Well, I mean, the most important thing is that I became a follower of Christ. And, and mm. if you had met me, you know, uh, b before that, you would have put all of your money on this is a guy who's never going to kind of flip here you know um <laughs> i was an atheist wow uh, secular humanist oh, wow. etc and and frankly my coming into being a, a christian had to do with with pain and bad stuff and mm. what um what happened was that w my wife and i were living the american dream which is how can you avoid pain how can you live in the nicest place, send your kids to the best school, go on the best vacations, etc.? And in the midst of that, bad things started happening. And the first thing was that my wife's brother drowned in front of my children. And it had a profound effect on my children and it had a profound effect on my wife. And my wife got depressed and she wouldn't get wow. treated. And, um, and then just kind of one after another thing happened and I had a patient who became obsessed with me and began to stalk me and do scary mm -hmm. stuff. And then one day the police went and checked on him and found his mother in the closet where he had taped her up and beaten her to death and been sprinkling carpet yes. freshener on her for a week. Um, and, and just, just all kinds of stuff that I can't share because it's just, it's mm -hmm. family stuff and everything. And then sort of the, 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 the last thing was that I got home from work, uh, on a, um, <clears throat> in, in the morning on a beautiful fall day. And, and everyone remembers what the sky was like on that fall day because it was September 11th, 2001. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of dozing on the couch and my wife walked in um, and said, something really bad is happening in New York. Let's turn on the television. And we watched as this unfolded and we kind of turned the television off. And my neighbor called me and she had a son, uh, my son's age. They'd kind of grown up together. And she said, I need your help. I have to get Jamie from school and tell him his father was in the first plane. Oh my goodness. And uh what happened was that I woke up to the fact that there was evil on the planet. And mm -hmm. evil does not fit a secular humanist scientific paradigm because it's a spiritual yeah. concept. And so I I reasoned, well if there's this evil here, where does the good come from? And and I was an ER doctor and ER medicine is good. <laughs> you know, I, I used yeah. to kind of marvel um, when we'd have a, a trauma code of a Jane or a John Doe. You know, if you're out jogging and a car hits you, you don't necessarily have your wallet with you. No one knows who you are. You, you come into the emergency department and you can look around and there can be 10 or 15 people all with, you know, hundreds of years of combined experience throwing every resource they have at you to save you. And you don't even have a name. And that is good. <laughs> and if you don't think God was there, <laughs> you don't know what God's about. Yeah. So, um, and so I knew there was good. And so I read through the Ramayana and the Bhagavad Gita and the Quran and, and a number of other books. And I didn't find an, an answer really that satisfied me. And then one day I was in the emergency department. It was a Sunday morning. Things were really slow and I needed something to read. I'm a voracious reader. And I went out looking in the waiting room and here was an orange book. It said Holy Bible on it. And mm. I went, you know, I have never read this and we don't own one. We had a library in our home, but, but we don't own one of these. And there's no way I can finish it before the first patient comes in. So I stole it. And... Uh, <laughs> I wonder, I, I'm sure God forgives stealing. A oh, Bible, he baited right? the, I mean, the, the trap. You know, yeah, I mean, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so, um, and I, and I met 
and I met Christ. Um, uh, it, it's called prevenient mm. grace in, in Wesleyan theology, yeah. and that's the grace that God extends to you before you know it. And, and that in that instance, my parents named me Matthew, and if they'd named me Numbers, we wouldn't be talking. So I started at the book of Matthew. <laughs> and... <clears throat> wow. That's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, man. And so then you just started, as you started diving into scripture, you started seeing these things. I mean, obviously you're, you, you can tell you're very, you're very much someone who gets underneath a lot of things and begins to, you know, analyze it and have understanding. Like you said, you're a voracious reader. You don't just take things at face value. And as you started diving into God's word, some things started really popping up to you. Some, some, some truths, some paradigm shifts, um, explain some of those things and, and why it shifted you quite a bit. Well, I, I think that the first thing in the first piece of scripture that really hit me was Matthew seven, and I'm just going to paraphrase it. Mm. Um, it, it says that we're always wanting to get a, a speck of sawdust out of somebody else's eye. Meanwhile, there's a two by four in our own. And by the way, I started life as a carpenter for seven years. I built houses before I went to college or whatever. And I, yeah, I recognized yeah. a carpenter telling a joke, you know, and and Jesus yeah. says, fool, hypocrite. You got, you got to get the log out of your own eye. Then you'll be given, you know, the ability to help other people with their specks in their eye. And so um, incidentally, uh a piece of trivia that is the only uh piece of scripture that i know that was rewritten by a non-christian and is better known than the original gandhi rewrote mm. that be the change you want to see in the world and he gives credit yeah. to matthew 7 in his autobiography um, wow. And so the first thing that I came to is we got to change our lives. We have to be the change, yeah. you know, that we we want to see. And I think the world goes at a crazy, crazy pace. And and yeah. so the first, if you will, spiritual discipline that we instituted was Sabbath uh, in our lives. And I um, I believe that was not me. That was divinely inspired uh, to do that. Yeah. Um, it is a. It is a. It becomes a piece of armor around you, actually. Right. Uh, as you go forward. Right. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, you know, I, I I want to at some point at a later date, I want to sit down with you for our listeners' sake and talk about. Sabbath and especially, you know, your work 24 six, it was so profoundly impacting, you know, in my life. Um, and that's something that we really emphasize in our ministry. But, but one of the things that you're also now talking quite a bit about it with this release of this new book is just mental health in general, particularly pertaining to suicide. And, um, I would love to just kind of hear a little bit about, you know, what, what you have begun to dive into as you've studied this and, you know, how, how the church is right now, it seems to be, uh, kind of inept to be able to know how to deal with this, you know, and, 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 and let's, let's dialogue about sure. that a little bit. Well, if, if you're going to approach any problem, you have to know how bad it is. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, when it comes to suicide, um, in the coming year, 10 million Americans are going to wrestle with whether or not to take their own lives. 10 million. And of that 10 million, one and a half million are going to end up in an emergency department being treated, evaluated, et cetera. And Man. despite all the advances in medicine, every 11 to 12 minutes, we lose somebody to suicide in this country. So the, yeah. the first thing you want to know, well, well how bad is that? <laughs> numbers are number, you know, and, and, and numbers right. are hard to you know, feel at the heart level or whatever. Right. So um, talk about nothing is wasted. I had 11 classes in statistics, uh, mostly graduate. And, uh, um, <laughs> and so I'm going to, I'm going to take you just a little bit. Don't worry. There's no, no higher math involved or anything. Um, <laughs> and, and just kind of look at that. So suicides are measured in the number per 100,000 per year. And that's so you can tell are things getting better or worse. Can you compare to another um, country, etc. So right now in the United States, we're at 14 and a half 
uh, suicides per 100,000 people per year. Well, what does that mm. mean? Again, you know, what does it mean? Well, the highest level that we've ever been is 14 and a half per 100,000 um, per year. And that, that number was reached during the Great Depression. But here's where the mm. nothing is wasted part, the 11 classes in statistics begin to kick in yeah. because those two statistics are, have no similarity whatsoever. And here's why. In yeah. 1930, it was pretty easy to kill yourself. If you overdosed on something, the, the majority of homes in the United States didn't even have a phone to call for help. Most towns didn't have an ambulance service. And if you lived in a town with an ambulance service and you happened to have a phone, most hospitals didn't have emergency departments. And so um, today we can summon a helicopter or an ambulance with our uh, something, a phone in our pocket. Uh, an ambulance mm -hmm. brings more life-saving you know, uh, equipment <laughs> and technology to the scene than an entire hospital had in the 1930s. Right. And so um, the the real question is, of that million and a half people who are going to end up in emergency departments, what would happen if all we had was 1930s technology? And we would go immediately to somewhere between 200 to 300 per 100,000 per year. Wow. And, it, and now it gets worse. In 1930, if somebody... Uh, was found dead on a floor with a heroin syringe uh, next to them, that was classified as a suicide. Today, unless there specifically is a suicide note, we count all of those as accidents. Yeah. So just add yeah. those back in and we'd go up over 50 uh, per 100,000. But it gets worse. <laughs> in 1930, people knew why they were depressed. The stock market had collapsed. The banking system had collapsed. Those are two separate things. And the economy had collapsed. One in four people are out of work. And the environment had collapsed. This is the era of the Dust Bowl. Um, millions right. of farmers are losing their farms. We're having storms in Oklahoma that are coating the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. in dust. So people knew why they were depressed. If you ask the average person today, they don't know. And it gets worse. <laughs> in 1930, there was no treatment for depression. Uh, insulin shock therapy hadn't even come about yet. Today, one in eight Americans are taking an antidepressant. One in eight adult Americans are kind of permanently on an antidepressant. And so yeah. if you really look at the real numbers of 300 plus per 100,000 suicides, per year unless you have technology we're looking at a situation society's never seen any society right. in all of history and so the first thing is like how bad is the situation it's never been encountered before um, mm. and then you know really the question is what is the church doing about it and I preached uh, not that far from you uh, a month or two ago, Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, mm -hmm. uh, which yeah. for your listeners who aren't familiar is a Jigunda um, right. uh, church. Huge. I think it's the fifth largest yeah. in the U.S. now or something like that. And I asked people first, I asked uh, early into my sermon, I asked how many of you have been affected by suicide, meaning how many have lost a friend or family member, not an acquaintance, but a friend or a family member. Half the hands went up. And then I asked 15, 20 minutes later, I said, how many of you have ever heard a sermon on this? And it's an eerie thing to be inside a gigantic auditorium like that with everyone looking yeah. around and not one yeah. single hand went up. So wow. the church has wow. completely checked out <clears throat> on this. Yep. Yep. The interesting thing is that up until about a century ago, the church was the only institution in Western society charged with preventing suicide. And they did a better job than, mm. than our modern uh, $4 trillion a year medical system in the United States is doing of preventing suicide. Mm. So I gotta, I've got this feeling the church has to get back in the game. <laughs> Here, we can't outsource yeah. Yeah. this one. Right. 
Right. Yeah, and you know, I think that's the case for really just addressing uh, pain in general. You know, um, it's one of the things that we find as well. As you know, as I travel and speak, I'm I'm realizing that it, it's very very few and far between that a lot of like the church as a whole is giving people permission to really start unpacking the pain that they're experiencing. We either whitewash it or we don't want to address it whatsoever, and we're not creating cultures where it's a it's a safe space to come forward with your pain for a lot of reasons. My question to you would be, if we're, if we're seeing that, uh, based on your assessment, based on what you've observed, what, why do you think that is the case? Why do you think the church has been mum on this? And, and, why, and, and you know, uh, what, like, what is it systemically? What's going on? I there? think um, that uh, what has happened is that we have developed uh, – a, a church that says um, it's all about having a great time now um, mm. and that we we go to church to have our ears tickled, <laughs> as yeah, it were. Right. And I was right. in a meeting a few months ago with a pastor who I was saying, can I come to your church and, and preach? And, and I'd been there before, but and there's another mega church. And the pastor said, yeah. you know, I'd love to do that, Matthew. But um, he said, we had a strategic meeting here and we thought we might lose someone if we ever use the word suicide. So we don't use that word inside church now. Oh, goodness. Here's the interesting thing. If you go to the Bible, <laughs> as far as I know, our, the Bible is the only sacred text that says where suicide comes from. You see, suicide is a uniquely human activity. There's no animal model of suicide. There's never been a zebra that woke up one morning and said, to heck with it, I won't run from the lion today. Yeah. You have to have a mind, a body, and a soul uh, uh, mm. in order to be affected by this. And if we look in Scripture right there on the first page, Adam and Eve are told by God, if you do this one thing, you'll be committing suicide. You will, quote, surely die. Mm. And Adam and Eve not only did that, um, but there's this shadowy figure named Satan that comes in and is pushing them. And if you just follow Satan through Scripture, that's his method of operation. He's trying to get Job to kill himself. Curse God and die, as the poetry of Job said. You don't curse God and your heart stops. He's trying to get Job to commit suicide. When, when wow. Satan interacts even with Christ, one of his ploys is to get Christ to jump off a high place yeah. and kill himself. And when Satan enters into Judas, Judas betrays the Lord and commits suicide. And if you want to come at this from the back end, um, when Jesus has the, the, that scene um, uh, with that demoniac at Gerasenes, and this man is described as being naked, out of his mind, breaking the restraints people are trying to put him in, and Jesus takes the demons from that man and throws them in a herd of swine. And that herd of pigs do the one thing animals never do. They go and kill themselves. And so our yeah, Bible yeah. tells us where this is coming from. Wow. <clears throat> and, and so when so, we hide that answer, yeah, when we no longer have it. And by the way, mm. um, the first person to kind of quantify uh, this effect was Emile Durkheim. Uh, in 1897, I believe, he published his book about suicide. He was a French sociologist, and he found that committed Christians were four to six times less likely to take their own lives uh, than an atheist. Mm -hmm. And that has been borne out in every piece of research done on it since then. Wow. Wow. So, you know, if that's the case, I mean, if we have the answer for it, if we have even some some explanation behind it, we have kind of some some root causes that we're able to bring forward out of out of our scriptures. Why are why is the church staying silent? Still? I think I, and I just ate breakfast with a pastor yesterday morning, went to a great seminary. I think this this particular person graduated at the top of their class. And I said, did you ever even have a single lecture on the theology of suicide? And he, and he said, no, and you've been to seminary, correct? Did you ever have a, well, I've been to Bible college. Didn't, didn't have, have a lecture one. on it. Nope. And so we had systematic theology and hermeneutics and how to preach and how to, you know, run business meetings at a church, but we didn't have anything on really the whole umbrella of 
mental yeah. health and pain and trauma. And so, you know? um, and so people are loath to teach on something they've never heard about. <laughs> and, and I think that's why the average pastor right. is just like, they don't know. And so this book yeah. I wrote as really a primer for the church on how to begin to get back into the game of this. And by the way, if we don't get back into the, the game of saving lives, and I shouldn't say game, right. back into the business um, business of event, yeah. uh, back into the calling of saving lives. My fear is that suicide will be normalized. And what I mean by that is that yeah. you'll be able to go down to the greeting card section of the store and get somebody a card that says, you know, in some Orwellian language, uh, something like, a, I want to support you in your life choice to go to the next plane or something like that. If you think I'm crazy, <laughs> uh, Canada has what's called the MAID law, the medical assistance in dying. That law was amended this year so that a person could go in and demand that a doctor put them to sleep, just like a dog or a cat or whatever, yeah. um, even if death was not imminent, and even if the only diagnosis is mental illness. Okay, so let me explain where this is going to go. <laughs> because um, we, uh, what, will, what will happen with this is not only will adults be able to do this, but children will. One of the weirdest moments in my medical career was as a senior res resident pleading with an 11-year-old girl to let me call her mother because we needed an adult on her side. Um, and, and I had to have her permission because she was an emancipated minor because she had just delivered a full-term baby. And the law of our land would not allow me to call her mother without her permission. And so we're going to have... 10, 11 year olds going into a doctor, being able to demand that they be put down, as it were. Yeah. Now, if you think it's in Canada and it's far off, I, I have to read you something. I, I put a yeah. um, op-ed piece in our city paper uh, here uh, two, three weeks ago. And I want to read you the last line of it and the response from the uh, editorial uh, board there. Society can continue to try and prevent suicide by doing more of what is not working. But I believe it is time to start allowing things like faith, God, love, and even the concept of suicide as a moral wrong back into our approach to suicide prevention. Here was the response from the paper. Just read through the op-ed, and the only problem is at the end where he brings up suicide as a moral wrong, and they struck that out. I am not allowed to have an opinion in an opinion piece that suicide is a moral wrong and that we ought to be stopping 10 year olds from doing it. Mm. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, there's a lot of people right now, Dr. Sleeth, who are listening to this and they either know someone or they themselves, their experience uh, where they find themselves in life right now, they, they feel under the, uh, the shroud and the cloak of this really deep, dark depression. They would probably qualify that they are experiencing some mental illness. They've had some thoughts of suicide ideation. Um, uh, there, and 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 to your point earlier, they don't really know why. They can't put their finger on it. You know, uh, like you said, back in the 1930s, there was a lot of things that you could kind of stack up and go, well, here's here's why some people are experiencing this. Now you're right. We're living in the land of opportunity. There seems to be so much abundance. There's so much, there's so much available to us. Uh, we're so connected with everybody, right? Mm -hmm. We have information and people at our fingertips. And yet we feel completely isolated, completely alone, completely depressed, anxious. Can you put your finger on maybe why we're experiencing this? Because I think it is helpful sometimes for us to step back and go, okay, maybe let's figure out why we, we're experiencing this before we kind of figure out what we're going to do about it. Yeah, I think that what we're seeing, uh, uh, first of all, is that we've built a society that's unlivable. Mm, unpack that. Yeah, um, talk about that. You know, we said so we have all this information at our fingertips. Information is not wisdom. Uh, mm. 
a phone in your pocket is not the same as somebody in the chair beside you and you're sharing your hearts. Um, and, uh, we, we have unanchored society, uh, from God and, and we're seeing Mm. the results of that. Now, here's the good news. So we can, we can reverse this. (laughs) Uh, we can reverse yeah. it as individuals and we can reverse it as uh, as a church society. And one of the things I did with this book, by the way, there's thousands of books about why people commit suicide. I wanted to know why is it that that people don't commit suicide? Um, oh, that's good, yeah. By the way, if you look at the church, and you look at people who've wanted to commit suicide. First of all, we can open our Bible. Moses was there. David was there. Yeah. Elijah was yeah. there. Elijah. Jonah was yeah. there. Paul the Apostle was there. Right. If we right. come forward out of the Bible, George Frederick Handel was there. C.S. Lewis was there. Charles Spurgeon, right. the Prince of Preachers, struggled with depression his whole life. Um, And so I wanted to know, well, how is it that those people got through it? How is it that they were able to, in in a sense, uh, you know, Mother Teresa, et cetera, these people really gave to society. Um, Yeah. And uh, it's interesting because when I wrote my first book, I gave an example of how, as a society, we have learned to go to the complete failures for answers. Yeah. Uh, and I gave as an example, there were um, there were two books that were the most popular books on relationships at the time and how to do a relationship. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and making relationships work. Stephen Gray and Barbara and D'Angelo, hmm. the authors of those. There's a relationship between the two of those. That was his fifth wife, and that was her third husband. Oh, wow. And uh, and so we tend to go to failures. And so I, I did the exact opposite. I went to people who had mm-hmm. gone through the dark night of the soul, gone through horrific experiences, yeah. and I learned from them what got them through. And that was every, everything from late teens up to 93 years old in, interviewing people. Wow. The number one reason that people gave for not committing suicide was fear, fear of the Lord, fear of consequences. And uh, fear is a great thing, but we don't preach fear in the church anymore. It can be a good motivator. Yeah, Yeah, Um, that's true. But fear keeps a child from running into the road. Fear keeps them from putting their hand on, on the stove. And fear of the Lord, the Bible says, is the beginning of wisdom. That's the foundation of right. wisdom. And so that was the wow. number one reason. And we should be afraid of an omnipotent God and want to, we want to figure out how can we get into a place where we have a right relationship with that, that God. Yeah. Um, the number two reason they gave uh, was that they were concerned f- for the impact on those who would be left behind. I don't believe there is a more beguiling uh, quality of a Christian in, than that they care more about others than themselves. Yeah. And, and so the, the, the fundamental things that were keeping people alive, you can't even mention in church. 99% of Christian books are about how to help yourself, not somebody else. Right. right. Uh, wow. And so uh, anyways... But so we have the knowledge and we, we have uh, the example in, in Scripture of what, what to do here. And by the way, Jesus made absolutely no distinction between mental and physical illness. He approached yeah. each of them. As, as a matter of fact, if anything, he could be said to have gone out of his way uh, for those with mental illness. The, 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 the demoniac at Gerasenes I mentioned earlier Right. Jesus, a kosher rabbi, went out of Hebrew territory to a mm-hmm. stinking pig farm to yeah. minister yeah. to uh, mental illness. And so we we have the tools. And in, in the book, I literally give people the sentences to 
to use to begin a conversation with somebody because you can literally save somebody's life here. Wow. Wow. It's an interesting topic that you bring up the idea of fear, you know, and it being a great deterrent, um, you know, it really being something that catalyzes someone to decide, Hey, I'm going to, I want to live. Um, you know, I've, I've heard that. I've heard that from people who, you know, we work with a lot of people who are going through grave dark, dark nights of the soul. And as we're in conversations with them, as we're pastoring them, as we're coaching them, I've heard that very exact thing. And some might listen to that and in their mind have a dialogue with you and say, well, you know, a lot of my trauma, a lot of my pain is stemming from the fact that I feel like God is somebody to be feared. But but the way they're seeing it is feared in an unhealthy way. You're talking about fear in a healthy way. Do you think you can kind of parse out the two of those for me and, and for the sake of our listeners right now? Sure. Um I, I think that un, unhealthy fear, and you know, I, I fear a rabid dog. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but that's yeah, healthy. But that's healthy. Yeah, you right? get away from the rabid <laughs> yeah. dog and everything. Yeah. Um, but the fear of the Lord is an understanding of what is great and what is powerful. Yeah. And, and, you know, just to change the mindset, by the way, the secular mindset that I was raised with uh, was that you're here by accident and nothing matters mm. after this plane of existence. Yeah. Yeah. But while you're here, you better make as comfortable great. as you can. Yeah. As as great as you can, as prominent as you can, as successful right. as you can. So so you can enjoy yeah. the best that, right. you know, the planet has to offer. Right. Flip that over to you are the creation of an all-powerful God who put you mm -hmm. here for a purpose. And finding that purpose right. and living into it is the greatest joy right. that somebody can have. And yes. and so, you know, you, those are two completely different worldviews. And, and, right. and frankly... Um, the, the longer I live with the God created me and he, and he made me for a purpose, life becomes this precious, precious thing that you want to give yeah. to others and, and, and help people experience, you know, the glory of living for God. Um, yeah. and, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's a difference in mindset, um, really. Right. Right. Yeah. It's amazing. The, <clears throat> almost the, uh, it seems paradoxical that the Christian life is calling us to become, as John the Baptist said, that, that we become less and less and that he become greater. And that that is actually the portal to us living in the most fulfill, fulfillment that we possibly can and, and living into purpose in, in, in an unprecedented way, right? And yet, if we try to do the opposite, where we boast of ourselves, make ourselves bigger, magnify ourselves, which is so much of what our culture tells us to do, tells us to do even in the little things like Instagram and, you know, uh, branding yourself and these kinds of things. That's what leads to a life that is empty and hollow and can, and lead us really quickly to these places of depression and mental and, health. Issues. And, and unfortunately the church has adopted a lot of the, you know, we have these super apostles and, and right. except, right. et cetera, et cetera. I remember my wife graduated from college Years and years. My wife and I have been married for 40 years. <clears throat> oh, congratulations. That's amazing. Um, and uh, my wife was graduating from college, and the person that gave the graduation speech was terrible. They didn't have a, mm. they didn't have an outline. I mean, they didn't even have an outline. They rambled. We wow. thought they didn't know their audience at all. And this little old lady said, you know, your life will have no meaning whatsoever until you learn that you were put on this earth to serve others. Wow. Fast forward. Wow. I got asked to do my first, you know, graduation uh, speech at a, uh, um, a university. And I wrote to my wife's alma mater and said, did anybody copy down what Mother Teresa said in her graduation speech? <laughs> and they had. And, you know, that piece, that thing that I rejected as nonsense was yeah. the truest yeah. words that probably anyone has ever spoken in a graduation speech. Not you can be wow. the best, but you can serve the most. Yep. 
That's great. Wow. That's so great. Um, so what do we do about this now? What's the prescription? Uh, and, I, and I'll ask that I'll ask it as kind of a twofold question. What's the prescription for those who are listening right now and they're experiencing this kind of this real deep dark night of the soul? You know, I mean, you're, you're a doctor and so you're used to giving people prescriptions or here's your diagnosis and here's what you need to do from here. here's a plan for you. Well, well be a doctor to our soul right now and give us that prescription. And then in a second, I'll ask, you know, what's the prescription for, for churches, sure. for church leaders. So first person. So I think if you're an individual and you are struggling with depression or mental illness, the first thing I would reassure you is that God loves you as much as he loved Paul the Apostle or David or Elijah mm. or George Frederick yeah. Handel or any of those, you know, heroes of the faith, as it were. Um, mental illness is no different than physical um, in, in that it, it, it's all part of just the fallen state of, of humanity and that Christ yeah. was there with you. I mean... And and the Bible understands depression, and we, and 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 I think all those wonderful uplifting lines are wonderful. But you need to go and read Psalm eighty-eight occasionally. Yeah, That's where yeah, Simon and Garfunkel sure. got "Hello, darkness, my old friend." You know, yeah. and um, that it doesn't mean that God isn't there with you, but you have an enemy, and that yeah. enemy wants you to take a a, a way out. That isn't what yeah. God wants. So if you ever hear a voice telling you to kill yourself, that that is your enemy. That is Satan. You run from that voice yeah. and you do whatever you have to at that moment. If it's called 911 or called the National Suicide Hotline, which people should just put in their phone, which is 1-800-273-TALK or 1-800-273-8255. If you have to, you know, grab grab for help. ERs are a lifeboat, and just go grab one. Um, people like me are there, and and they love taking care of sick people. <laughs> okay, um, yeah. yeah. There's there's nothing more thrilling, really, than being able to help somebody through those really really difficult moments in their life. Right. Um, and so there's nothing to be ashamed of, and and and. Um, and the second thing I, I think is is that I I believe that you should begin to develop disciplines in your life which are life affirming and life giving. If you went on right. to Netflix, and I just did this recently, and you can kind of put your cursor over each of the offerings, and they'll give like a three three words that summarize, and so many of them are dark, dystopian, yeah. um, etc. You can't put garbage into your into your mind yeah. and hope to co have roses come out the other end. Right. Jesus right. says the eye is the is the window to the soul, and if your eye is dark, how dark your soul will be. In other words, if you're looking out at darkness, um, th there's it's really hopeless in a way, and so you need to begin to look on on what is is beautiful and true and pure and all those yeah. those things in uh uh listed in um uh Philippians 4:8. Right. Um, right. And in the book Hope Always there's lists of what movies will bring you up. What and and this isn't a Pollyannish but it's an inspiring kind of right. lifting. And 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 what kind of uh movies, books, uh uh music, etc we are a product of what we put into ourselves and i think um birds of a feather flock together again you want to get around people that that sharpen your skills of life and inspire you to go out and give um that sort of thing and and just to know that god's always there with you and do whatever you have yeah. to to get through to the uh the next day so many of these yeah. people the woman who was 93 related just this horrible thing that happened to her um when she was about 40 and um she just she really really came close to um taking her own life and but she struggled through that and and a church community helped her do that and if you're not in a church 
that's there to help you through through the valley of the shadow of death, you, you're not in a church. <laughs> Go find one that'll help you. Right. Um, yeah. And and then she said, and now I've had almost 50 years of the most wonderful life, you know. And so it's to reassure you that there's something on the other side of this. Um, and then yeah. to the church, I, I think we need to begin to to welcome people and to worry less about uh, certain things and more about when somebody walks into a church and I recount in the book uh, a time of doing this being at a church with 10,000 just at one service and it emptied out and the worship leader who'd flown in from London and I are looking at each other and there wasn't a soul that had asked us out to eat. Wow. Imagine if you came in there looking for fellowship, Yeah, what yeah. that uh, feels like. So I think churches need to start worrying more about what's for lunch after mm. church, <laughs> hmm. you know, than, wow. than some of those wow. other things. Uh, and, and it can be That's pizza. Good. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, sure. when, uh, when Abraham <laughs> ran out to the angels, he went back and they, uh, they offered a cheeseburger, you know, it was veal bread and cheese, you know, <laughs> That's right. That's uh, awesome. And so oh, I think awesome. the church has to begin to to realize that they have the answers, they have power here, and uh, yeah. and the, and the secular people are looking for this. Suicide hurts so much. The families right. are devastated, and uh, we right. need to begin to give answers. And that's not to put down traditional medicine at all. If somebody is is taking uh, medicine for psychiatric reasons, never stop that without your prescriber yeah. saying that's okay. But use every yeah. tool at your disposal to get through it, just as you would with yeah. cancer. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Dr. Sleeth, this has just been an incredible conversation, and uh, I'm so grateful for you giving us the time to to discuss these things. I want to make sure everybody goes and picks up hope always how to be a force for life in a culture of suicide. And, um, I, is there, is there ways that we can follow what you're doing? Have you have, you have a website? I have a, have, um, are you on any of the social channels? I have a website. Kind of along, Supposedly so? I have a Twitter thing. I have <laughs> people who work for me do it. <laughs> um, but, uh, Matthew yeah. MD.com or blessed okay. org. Um, would be that, okay. or if you forget those, Google, uh, Google my name, it'll, it'll, you know, suck you into one, one of those things. And the one thing yeah. I would tell people is, um, if, if somebody doesn't have the money for this book, you write to me, I'll send you one. Or if somebody's running mm -hmm. a ministry, so we just got a, a place that has 13 to 18 year olds, uh, women coming out of prostitution. They needed 50 books. You just, you wow. just write. And you're in a prison ministry or something, you, you let us know. We'll, we'll get That's behind great. you. That's great. Well, if you're listening to this in real time, right as we release it, be on the lookout because we'll be giving away a copy of this book as well on our social media. And, um, but, man, Dr. Slee, thank you so much. This has just been an honor. Uh, likewise. And, and bless you and your listeners. And, and really, if somebody's out there hanging on by your fingernails, just, just uh, grab on to the things we've talked about.